Hi everybody, this is Rahul with the Alternative Investors Hangout, and today we have here Ian Gordon. He's the president of Longwave Group. He's here to talk about the economy and his views on the fiat, fiat money system. Thanks for coming on, Ian. Well, thank you for having me. All right. The first thing I wanted to get into is Europe. We have the 10-year yield hovering around 7% in Italy, and yields are continuing to rise in the other pig countries. What do you see happening in the short term? Do you think there will be more money printing from the ECB or QE3 via the Fed? Well, um, I'm not sure if we're going to get the QE uh, portion of you know in the ECB because I think Germany is uh, dead against that. You know, they've had experiences of uh, hyperinflation in Germany, and and Germany's always effectively managed its money very very well. And, uh, I think that's why it wants to put a dose of uh, uh, proper management within the within the euro. So I don't think we're going to get that. Uh, you know, we are going to see that there's uh, more money probably being made available to the banks, but the, uh, effectively the European banks, probably and the American banks and the British banks are uh, effectively bankrupt anyway. So. Um, and certainly, the money that they get, they they simply park it back with the uh, with the Central European Central Bank anyway. So there's no money going back into the economy, and uh, and all the austerity programs that Germany is insisting on from these European governments is going to, uh, in effect, uh, cause even uh, greater hardships and uh, effectively uh, make the economy even worse than it already is. So I just don't see any way out. Uh, in Europe for the kind of the problems that she's going through and I suspect that uh, in 2012 we'll see that the euro will collapse. So when the euro does collapse, what do you see happening with the dollar? Do you think that it's just going to automatically strengthen and what will happen with the U.S. banking system since they're about, I don't know, trillions of dollars in derivatives? What's your take on that then? Well, you know, uh, in my work, we we basically uh, we work on a, a long-term cycle, and um, we believe that uh, effectively we're very much uh, in the same period as we were in the early 30s, so in the depression of the 30s, and and at that time we had a, a world monetary crisis quite similar to the crisis that's now unfolding, and we kind of had anticipated that in much of our writing that the, the, that crisis would develop and would start in Europe much as it did in the 1930s. Uh, at that time, it was Austria that collapsed first, uh, but you know, and then it went on into Germany, and then eventually England was forced out of the monetary system in September 1931. Um, but what happens when that you know when the euro collapsed is that the World investors turn their attention to who's likely to be next, uh, much as they did in the 30s, and uh, I'm pretty sure the attention will be directed to the United States and and Britain, and uh, you know they will start to sort of uh, America will find it very difficult to borrow money, uh, particularly at these very low interest rates. Uh, China and and uh, Japan will start to pull back from lending the. Uh, U.S. money and so on. So interest rates will rise, and and eventually I can see that the whole dollar system too, and the will collapse as well. Much as the whole monetary system between 1931 and 33 collapsed. So I think we're going to go through kind of a similar experience: uh, total world monetary uh, system collapse. So speaking of the 30s, 30s was deflationary. Do you see? To think that this will be more of an inflationary depression? No, I, I don't. I, I just think that that's an oxymoron. I just don't think you can have a depression with in, with inflation in it because a depression simply means an economy that's basically dead uh, with massive unemployment. You, you know, if you go back to the depression of the 30s, the U.S. unemployment was 25 percent. The GDP in the United States collapsed by 45 percent. In that kind of environment, it's very difficult to see um, an inflation uh, developing, and we're already seeing deflation sort of occurring in the United States. It's starting in the, you know, in the housing market, and uh, 
and will eventually go to every other facet of the economy because simply because more and more people are going to be thrown out of work as they were in the 30s and simply they you know they're going to struggle just to survive uh, so prices generally in that kind of environment have to drop no i think the but the whole system is collapsing the whole monetary system and this is a very frightening kind of uh, experience that we're going to have to go through because when the monetary system the paper money system collapses all paper money is credit so effectively credit collapses as well means the economy actually seizes because today's economy is simply uh, is derived from credit uh, so you you know uh, everything is uh, you deliver and we'll pay you when you deliver well uh, you know so that uh, that's the sort of a credit system you know they get paid in 30 days or whatever it is well there isn't going to be any credit Right. So you're talking about the Western world that will crumble, but what about the powers of the East? What about Japan and China? Do you think that they will face the same problems as us, or they will be able to weather the storm? Well, no, I think everyone is going to have to face the same problem, much as we did in the 30s. I mean, it was a worldwide uh, phenomenon. You know, uh, you know, the United States in the 30s, uh, went through a, a, a massive baptism of fun. I, I, I kind of see the United States as quite similar to China, uh, you know, the United States of the 20s and 30s. Uh, at that time, you, the U.S. was the world's greatest credit nation by an, a long shot, and also she uh, uh, started really during the First World War and thereafter to develop a, a massive industrial complex, and, you know, and she was a huge exporter. Uh, and much as China has sort of done the same thing this time around, and China, of course, is the world's largest creditor nation by a long shot. Uh, however, um, when you're a creditor, when you're lending money, and the the people who you've lent it to can't pay you back, um, it puts an awful lot of pressure on um, on your banking system. And this is really what happened in the United States in the 30s, because the U.S. banks were lending money and not only within the United States, but effectively all over the world. And uh, it, it collapsed the whole U.S. banking system between 1931 and th uh, 1929 and 33. 10,000 U.S. banks failed at that time. So I think the Chinese banks are going to go through the same kind of process. That, you know, there's been massive malinvestment in China, uh, lending out money to build cities that, in, in which no one lives, shopping malls in which... Uh, uh, no one shops and so on. So I, I think the Chinese banking system is going to collapse much like the U.S. banking system collapsed in the 1930s. Speaking of China, you com you're comparing it to the U.S. in the 1930s. So do you believe that China will be the world's reserve currency then, just like the United States took over the world's reserve currency, I believe, in 1944 at Bretton Woods? Um yeah, I mean, effectively, the world's reserve currency always has gone to the world's uh, largest credit nation, and and you can see that, you know, the uh, the British pound uh, in the 1800s, you know, Britain was the world's largest credit nation, and so the pound effectively became the um, reserve currency of the world. The United States was the world's largest credit nation in the 1900s, and she and therefore the dollar became the world's reserve currency. And um, and now I, I'm pretty sure that the fact that China, you know, will be the world's largest credit nation, and, sh and the uh, Chinese yuan, or remember, will, you know, take over and become the world's reserve currency. She's moving in that, China's sort of moving in that direction. You can see these sort of agreements that she's forging in Asia where they're, they're squeezing the dollar out. She's just done that uh, an agreement with Japan in which uh, they will settle in their in their own local currencies, uh, so you know, in trade between the two countries. And she's done that in several other nations, like with Brazil and so on. So uh, she's starting to squeeze the dollar out anyway. China is so, and we'll, you know, but we're going to go through effectively a massive depression. You know, as the debt is wrung out of the system. And when that uh, depression sort of become, gets over, when we get over it, you know, I think China will emerge as the greatest uh, political and military and financial power in the world. Do you think that China will go back on some sort of gold standard? 
I mean, do you think that countries around the world would go back in a gold standard, including China? I'm pretty sure that China's even working towards that kind of premise because she's already, uh, you know, she doesn't try to, doesn't like to tell us what she's doing, but we know that she's trying to buy as much gold as she can. She's even going to gold producing companies and saying, we'll buy all your output from you. So, um, I'm pretty sure that China is accumulating and fast accumulating gold, and I think that eventually the world will be forced to some kind of uh, system that imposes a discipline. You know, fiat systems there's absolutely no discipline, and that's what's got us into this into the trouble that we're in right now. You know, because they printed it so much paper money that it's created so much debt uh, worldwide, and that whole debt bubble is now collapsing and so I think eventually China will have a massive gold reserves and she'll peg the wine to to gold all right just one last question and it is regarding gold so what's going on with the price of gold right now we've seen a huge decrease from 1920 to around 1560 the last day of the year is this because of MF global are people just leaving the paper market because they're scared which is putting downward pressure on the price of gold, or how do you see this? I think you know, I, you know, I'm not. I, I suspect that what's happening is, yeah, you know, there's a huge uh, move to liquidity. I mean, people, um, you know, the European banks want to get liquid and so on. But uh, you know, I've been bullish on gold since 2000, and it's, and we, you know, we've basically gold has always made a higher high price. Uh, since 2001, so for the past 11 years, gold has uh, made a higher price than the year before, and we we did that in 2011. And I suspect, I'm, I'm pretty confident that we're going to do, see the same thing happen in 2012, particularly if I'm right about this whole collapse of the of the paper money systems around the world, because then the flight to gold is going to be uh, very extreme. So do you see, let's say, a one-to-one gold ratio to the Dow, just like in the 30s and 1980? Um, well, I work very closely with that, and and I've written about it uh, several times. Uh, the lowest that we've ever been is that one-to-one -one relationship, uh, one ounce of gold to buy the Dow Jones Industrials. But I think this time around we're going to see something like a better, maybe a quarter to one. In other words, a quarter of an ounce of gold to buy the Dow Jones Industrials. So, you know, my target for the Dow is 1,000. And the mm -hmm. target for gold is 4000 Wow. <laughs> All right, Ian. So how can people do business with you? Well, not really. I mean, I have a website, the longwavegroup.com, and, you know, and basically that's, you know, there's a subscriber-paid website, and um, that's actually that's my business. All righty. Thank you, Ian, for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Will. Yep.